This morning we are back in Romans chapter 7. We're going to go through the first 13 verses. As you remember, the book of Romans is basically the Apostle Paul sharing the gospel. And he begins by telling us how out of shape we are spiritually and how we need a savior. And then he explains how all of the things in which we've trusted in, maybe naturally, are just incomplete and they're basically empty because we trust on performance instead of trusting in God. We trust in our perfectionism instead of trusting in him and having a relationship. And so today he's going to talk about grace versus the law again, and we're going to look at it here in chapter 7. He begins, and I'm, I've titled this the, the power of the law. In chapter 7, verse 10, it says this, and the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. I don't know how many of you are uh, fond of the law, unless you're a lawyer. Um, <laughs> But whenever you hear about law, it's usually that you've broken it. Uh, in fact, that's the very reason that laws are there. Not that you break them, but that's so that you know that you broke them. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that, but pray with me before we get started. Father, as we bring our hearts before you and as we look into your word, we realize that we have things to learn. We have ways that we need to change. And I pray that you might do that by your Holy Spirit because none of us here is perfect. None of us has achieved anything. And certainly without you, Lord, there's no good thing that dwells in us. And we thank you that you have come and made a difference in our lives as our Savior. Pray that you might fill us with your Holy Spirit, with understanding, with kindness and love towards one another today, and help us to understand your plan so that we know how we fit in. We pray you help us with that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to jump in. Remember, we're in the book of Romans. We're going to be in chapter 7, which is right in the middle of the sin and sanctification part. Everyone basically stands guilty before God, and it doesn't matter where you are, if you're someone on a desert island or somebody very well-versed in the Old Testament or even the New Testament, all of us stand before God as hypocrites because we know all of the right things to do, and yet we don't do those. And when we get to the second half of chapter 7, we'll talk about that. We talked, uh, we talked previously in chapter 6 about how we're dead to sin. Sin is no longer to be reigning in our mortal bodies. Sin doesn't tell us what to do. Addictions have no place in a Christian's life because sin doesn't tell you what to do. You're not a slave to sin. You're a slave to Christ. Amen? Amen. So moving on to chapter 7. He begins here in verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren and I speak as those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not the oldness of the letter. But what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Well, certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin taking opportunity by the covenant, by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, 
sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then that which is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might be exceedingly sinful. I'm going to ask a question. How many of you feel like you're in law school? <laughs> We're going to go through it. We're going to go through the step at a time, and you're going to see it has a very logical flow to it, if you haven't noticed that already, and it has a very understanding meaning. And we're going to pick it up as we go through. So hang in there. The law. Uh, you know, normally, you know, we have all kinds of songs about the law. You know, I fought the law and the law won. You know, we have all kinds of <laughs> songs about the law. You know, I shot the sheriff, I issued the Jeopardy. You know, there's all these songs about the law coming down. And, the, you know, when you think of the law, there are lots of different ways to think of it. There's the law of God which God has created, and he's explained to us through the, the 66 chapters, uh, 66 books of the scriptures. So that's God's demonstrated will. He tells us what he would have, and we call that the law. Uh, the Ten Commandments is very often called the law. Uh, the, the first five books of Moses is called the law. Uh, gravity is called the law. <laughs> so we, when, when you talk about the law, there are all different sorts of aspects of it that you can think of. Basically, it is the right thing to do. I break it down to simplicity because it's the only way I can remember things. Uh, so that's why I explain it so simply because I'm a simple man. It's the thing that you should do. Like a stop sign. It's not there for people who are cautious who stop anyway and go through. It's for people who are tempted to just not even care. Like me, <laughs> if I'm in a hurry, or you. Lights are not there for people that don't understand intersections. They're for people who are not paying attention. We, there, there are laws throughout the world that are put there for people that would be breakers of the law. And yet, the laws are being broken everywhere. In fact, today, it's actually a cool thing to be part of a group that breaks the law. Whether you're on the far left or on the far right, uh, people are polarizing. Have you noticed that? You're, you're getting radical people on both sides. So they just tried to, anyway, I don't want it to be about, the, you guys came here to get away from all of that. But here's the law. You either hate it or you, or you embrace it. If you embrace it, you yourself are a lawbreaker, so what do you do when you find that out? I don't know about you, but when I drive, I expect everyone to obey all the laws, although sometimes I don't. And I'm not talking like an emergency, like my wife's giving birth. I'm talking about I'm just in a hurry or I've had too much caffeine or something. <laughs> so the law is this sort of an understanding. It's, it's doing the right thing. And whatever it is that you understand that right thing to be, certainly the scriptures explain it to us, our society does. And then we have certain laws like entropy and gravity, which as you get older begins to take over. So there are certain laws, and you can't avoid them, and, and you can't necessarily skirt around them. So when, when he talks about the law, understand it's just the right thing to do, and if you get that, it'll be a bit easier to understand. He begins by saying, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak as those who know the law. By the way, this is the book of Romans, so he's writing to the Romans, Romans which law was extremely important to them, as well as to the Jews, if you think about the the whole hierarchy of the Jewish temple and all, the laws were very, very important, but they were God's laws. In Rome, it was, you know, that's where we got democracy, uh, you know, uh, from Greece. And so the law, he's speaking to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Did you know that? As soon as you die, it's all over. The speeding tickets are null and void. doesn't matter what vehicle you're in. You won't get one because you're dead. <laughs> and then he brings up the example of marriage. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. 
by the way, that's what the scripture teaches. If you get married, it's a lifetime commitment. So ladies who are not married, men who are not married, make sure you make the right choice because you are bound, that word's chosen very carefully, bound to that person as long as you live. And people very easily will make that commitment at the altar, but then one, two, three, five, ten, twenty years down the road, you tend to forget. It's a lifelong commitment. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. Some people would go, yay. <laughs> you know, I'm free, I'm free at last. So it, it begins at the altar, and he's using the example of the law, which is, you know, doing the right thing, and God's expressed will in his scriptures. He's saying that law, in fact, all laws only apply to living people. Because once you die, all bets are off, right? So death terminates the law. And doesn't mean murder is the way out of your marriage. <laughs> which you might think does not need to be said at church on a Sunday. But this is the only way out right here, uh, according to the scriptures. And yet, <laughs> murder sometimes people believe is an option to get out of a marriage. It's not murder, it's death. So that's a very different thing. Although there are people who actually believe that they can get out of a marriage by killing their mate. And they tend to be men, but there are women who do it on occasion. Uh, and there are some very famous people who are accused of killing their wives or girlfriends to get out of a relationship. But you understand, Paul is teaching a principle that the law does not apply to somebody who is dead. Right? You get it. Okay. Verse 3, so then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law. You guys understand that, right? If you're a widower or, or, a, or a widow and your mate dies, you're free to marry again. Make sure you choose well because it's, it's a difficult relationship. If her husband dies, she's free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, she's no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So as long as you are married, as long as there is a, a, a relationship and it's a covenant before God that you've said, you're bound until the, the end. And of course, there are ladies who are looking for Mr. Perfect, right? How many of you are looking for Mr. Perfect? We're all laughing because we know better. <laughs> it begins, ladies, with trying to find Mr. Perfect, right? And you think you found him. And oh, what a wonderful day. And I'm going to spend $50,000 on a wedding. That's where it begins. And of course, you know, everybody's dream guy, at least way back when, was Fabio. You know, I'm looking for Fabio because he's on the cover of every... You know, uh, you know, dicey novel that you might read uh, for the ladies. By the way, that's, that's female pornography, just so that you know. Um, it truly is. M males, they go for the visual usually, and females go for the, the hyper-romantic. And, of course, he's on all, the, all these dime store novels. Anyway, so you're looking for Mr. Perfect, and you look to get married, uh, and then it doesn't take long until you realize uh, he, he's not so perfect because he doesn't measure up. And let's say he did. Let's say you found Mr. Perfect and he did everything right. How are you going to look walking around with that guy? <laughs> if he's always impeccably dressed, if his language is always perfect, if his behavior is always perfect, if he goes and works the perfect job, makes the perfect amount of money, gives you the perfect house, what, what are you doing with that guy? That's what it is to serve the law. Because serving the law and being married to the law and saying, this is the way that I live, in fact, most people do. If you ask them if they're going to heaven, they'll say, yes. And you ask them why. And they will say, because I'm a good person. 
because I'm married to the law. You see, I believe in the law of perfection, of doing everything right. Well, that's unusual because how do you measure up? Well, you might not be able to put a finger on anybody, but Paul said the same thing. He says, I was, I was born into, the, into Israel. I was circumcised in the eighth day. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He says, concerning the law, I was blameless. Nobody could point the finger at me and say, I did anything wrong. Now, I don't know if you and I could say that. I, I repeatedly do things wrong on a daily basis. Paul says, as far as the law is concerned, I was blameless. Nobody could point their finger at me and say I did anything wrong. Wow, that's a lot of pressure to spend time with somebody like that because they tend to expect that from everyone around them. Being under the law, being under this burden of perfectionism, of living up to everything that God has said and all of your own expectations and all the expectations of others is a trap because you can't. And so what you do is you just try to cover up your mistakes. You try to cover up your shortcomings. You try to cover up where you fall short because I can't let you know because that's the standard by which we judge everyone. You see how stifling and deadening this law thing is, trying to be good enough for God to love me or good enough for you to, to at least not think I'm a scoundrel. That sort of mentality is completely alien to having a relationship with God which was purchased by the blood of his own son so that you're adopted into a family. And it's no longer about living a perfect life. It's about living in relationship. And it's a vastly different thing. Amen? Amen. And I'm so glad I'm in a relationship with my Heavenly Father because then I'm free to just be myself and not try to cover up and try to pretend I'm something I'm not. Amen. So, being married to the law is a little like the far right picture. You, you think you're going to get into it and it's going to be great and you're going to live a perfect life and you have your life all planned out and your dreams and your dream job and, you know, I'm going to go to college and uh, somebody else is going to pay for it for me. And, you know, like you have everything all figured out and it doesn't quite happen that way. And if you decide that you're going to be under that law, you're married to that law forever and ever until the day that you die or it dies. You can't live up to your own expectations. How are you going to live up to God's? And so this is how we're looking at the law, and that's how Paul is taking it. But you see, there's someone else that we're to be married to, and that's the Lord. Yes, men. We are to have that sort of an intimate relationship with God. In fact, the church very often is called the bride of Christ. That's men and women together. That's a little weird for a guy. But to be in a relationship with God where he has purchased you and you are the bride means that we're in relationship. And I don't have to be perfect because he was. He lived up to the law and did everything that the law says should be done. He lived a perfect life and we killed him for it. We're not in that relationship. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Revelation 19.7. It talks about being ready to enter into the, the relationship with our God when we leave this place. And that's finally when we'll be out from under the condemnation very often of the law and not being good enough. But Jesus has already taken that away. We don't have to live in that. You and I have made mistakes. What do you do with that? You and I continue to make mistakes. What do you do about that? I come before the Lord, I confess my sins, and I know he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness so I don't keep doing the same thing over and over. Amen? Amen. That's what it is to live free in Jesus Christ. Verse 5, so for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. What? For when we were in the flesh, those of you who have come to know Jesus Christ have had a, a born-again experience, have become a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things are gone. Behold, all things are new. If you have that, then you remember those days, even as uh, Agnes was singing today, to remember. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Simply put, 
all you have to do is put a sign that says wet paint and somebody will sit on it. You ever see a sign wet paint? The temptation is to take your finger and go, oh, it's not that wet. <laughs> the sign is there to tell you something. It's to tell you to leave the thing alone or your fingerprints will be indelibly, you know, into this piece of artwork now that you've done it. So it's one of those things. You, you see a present under the tree and it says, do not open till Christmas. The mind goes wild. The ladies had a retreat here yesterday and the lunch came 45 minutes early. <laughs> there were people milling about and selecting which sandwich they were gonna have and what portion. It was all under plastic so you could see it, but you weren't supposed to open it. I went in the kitchen the other day and there was stuff all over this cart that we use for the men's breakfast and it said, for women's breakfast, do not touch. <laughs> And there were signs on the water, women's breakfast, do not touch. I opened the fridge, women's breakfast, do not touch. I got to tell you, I went. And not only that, I had to get all that stuff off the cart because I needed the cart. And so I put my hands all over that stuff and unloaded the cart so we could use it. But it's a funny thing, and we laugh about it, but when there's a law and there's a direct something that is told to you with authority, there's a rebellion. There's a rebellion. Who are you? You're not my father. You know, like there's this thing, and it's, and it's a thing, and we all have it. And it's not just us. I mean, it's, it's, it's everyone, really. But that's the... That's the the law. The law arouses passions in us. We used to work at Home Depot, and it says, do not use blades to open. It was like, <laughs> yeah, right. The inexperienced people that don't know how to open packages, that's who that's for. That's not for me. <laughs> see, because I know how to use a razor knife. And see, the law is applied to everyone else but me. And there's the rebelliousness that comes up. And that is the purpose of the law. It says, do not use blade to open. And there's the movie called Blade. And that's just the mentality of people is, I, I have to do it because I was told I can't do it. And that's the sinful nature, isn't that? Any of you have children know that you gave birth to little sinners. Every one of them. And, and it's a good thing they're cute and small. We can control them and we don't kill them. But this is what it does. It arouses, when you see wet cement, they just put the cement and all the work is left. You, you get to put your hand in it, your foot in it, you get to write something in it, you get to put the date in it, or, you know. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, all right, all right, all right. So, so I'm not the only one, okay. This is the sin nature. Do not write on wet cement is what somebody wrote in wet cement. I think that's <laughs> amazing. It's a testimony forever that the law controls you. It's a funny thing when there's a commandment, when there's a law, when there's some kind of instruction, the first thing you do naturally is rebel. What happened with Adam and Eve? God gave them a perfect place. He made them perfect. He loved them. He spent time with them. He had fellowship with them. There's just one job you have. Don't eat of this tree because the day you do, you will surely die. Or what you will do is you will allow death to come in and take hold of this earth. And we've been suffering ever since. Just one thing. It shows it's in our nature. Because there's a command, it arouses something in our nature and we need a savior <laughs> because we can't handle that. So... They can, you can even use this for merchandising. They have many books for children, math books and all these. It says, do not open this book. You know what the first book is the kid wants to read? That book. And, you know, people use this all the time, you know. Um, Jim Gaffigan's a comic, and he talks about how uh, parents lie to their children all the time. And he's, uh, he, he talks about sitting there and eating ice cream and explaining to his kids, oh, no, this is very spicy. You wouldn't like this. 
and you know, we don't like, we don't think lying is a good idea. We don't believe in it. And yet he says, anyone who's a parent, they've lied. They just do. So this is our nature. What happens is there's this sinful passion that gets aroused in us, this desire to break the law, the desire to do what I want to do, almost because somebody said, don't do it. You put a sign up that says, don't walk on the grass, you'll have a muddy path in no time. And that's just the nature. Uh, there are motels that say, do not fish from the balcony. You know, they're out on a, on a, yeah. uh, over the water. Nobody would even think of fishing from the balcony <laughs> unless they put a sign up, and now everybody's fishing from the balcony. <laughs> It's just our sinful nature. Anybody that doesn't say we have a sinful nature isn't being honest. So, there were, when we were in the flesh, when we were completely given over to do whatever we want to do and we haven't committed ourselves to Christ, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members, in our body, to bear fruit to death. When we were given over to the flesh, we just did whatever the flesh said and then we suffered for it. We hated ourselves. I don't know if you were like that. I hated myself. Verse 6, but now we've been delivered from the law, having died to that which we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You see, if somebody says, so you're a Christian, you say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means I read the Bible and I pray and I go to church and I give to other people and I, you know, that's what I do. Is that what being a Christian is? No. If you think that's what a Christian is, you've just fallen under the law. It's about coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, to God the Father, because I'm a sinner and broken, and I needed to be fixed, and now the Spirit of God lives inside of me, and I don't naturally, I don't have to give over to my selfish desires. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm a slave to righteousness. And God put a new heart in me and he put a new mind in me. And I'm a new person. That's the born again experience. It's not, hey, I'm a Christian because I read the Bible and I go to church and I give 10% of my pay and I, you know, like that. Okay, I understand that that's kind of the outgrowth of what a relationship is. But if that's what you think being a Christian is, you missed it. We died to the law. It's not that we don't want to please God and do what he wants us to do. It means that we do love God and we want to do what he wants to do instead of having to do what God wants us to do. There's a big difference, right? I got to get up and go to church. I mean, wouldn't you love that if I did that this morning? I'm going to go and teach these people. They never listen. You would love to have me as a pastor. This room would clear out real quick. I got the best job in the world, so I tell you what, I love serving the Lord, and I love being here, and I don't care if I have to get up early and stay up late and, you know, set up every chair. I don't give a rip. I love it here. I love doing what the Lord calls me to do. We've been delivered from the law. It's not about what you have to do. It's not the, the have to's. It's you get to. It's a much different world. If you know anything about um, 1862, I'm sure you have that right on the top of your head, uh, Victor Hugo wrote a story called Les Miserables or Les Miserables, however you want to say it. You could get all Frenchy with it. But he, he wrote this thing, and in 1998, they came out with this movie. And uh, this is the particular movie that I like because Jeffrey Rush plays Javert. How many of you have seen this? Javert. And then uh, Jean Valjean is uh, Liam Neeson, uh, whose name I love to say, Liam Neeson. It's just lyrical. Anyway, and Uma Thurman and Claire Danes. So uh, that's for you, Scott, because you know everything. So there's this, wonderful, there's this wonderful story about a man who robs a, a loaf of bread, and they put him in jail for nine years. And because he has a rebellious spirit all the time, he rebels. And so... That's why he stayed there for so long. So finally, he learned to shut up, and he got away, and he was released. But of course, in, in this period of time, if you were a criminal, you were always a criminal, and nobody trusted you, and he had burned all his bridges by then. So he's looking for a place to stay, and somebody says, well, there's a place you could go uh, instead of sleeping out on the street, and he was basically a vagrant. So sends, sends him over to the bishop's house, and the bishop sees him at the door, and takes him in out of Christian kindness and out of love. 
and, you know, takes his coat and he sits them down at a table and he feeds them this sumptuous meal and the guy's just like eating like a pig and they're all kind of looking at him, you know, the house servants and the bishop. And the bishop is being completely kind and loving toward him and he says, listen, let's get you some clothes, let's get you a nice bed. And he says, you know, if I could just sleep in a bed for one night, I'd be a new man. And he goes, well, we'll do that and you can be a new man. So he gets him, he gets him a bed and so the bishop shows up and he sends him to bed and Jean Beljean says, what a sucker. And he gets up in the middle of the night and he goes into his cupboard and he steals all of his silver. You know, they have like silver uh, candlestick holders and all of the silver and he goes, this guy, there's more silver, there's more value to that silver than anything I ever earned. And so I'm gonna steal from this guy and I'm gonna hit the road. So he takes the graces of this good man and he, he steals his silver and the bishop gets up and he comes into the, into the place where he is and he says, what are you doing? And the guy beats him, sends him to the floor and he, he takes off running. Well, a couple days later, the police catch him and they bring him, the constables bring him back to the bishop's house and they bring him in and they say, this man has said, that he spent the other night here with you. Is that true? And he says, yes, that's very true. And he goes, we, we caught him with all this silver on there, and of course we assumed that he stole it from you. And he said, no, not at all, I gave it to him. And he says, Jean Valjean, you, you left in such haste, you forgot to take the candlesticks. And he goes into the cupboard and he brings out these, these silver pieces for the candles, which are worth far more than what he took. And he says, you had forgotten these. And he says, my dear brother, you, you ran off in such haste. And he gives it to him. And uh, the, the constables are, you know, flabbergasted. And they say, really, this is true? And he goes, absolutely, it's true. And so the constables leave. And there's this guy, this criminal, who beat him. He's still got a black eye from it. And the most wonderful thing that he says, and somebody put it to song, but remember this, my brother, see in this some higher plan. You must use this precious silver to become an honest man. By the witness of the martyrs, by the passion and the blood, God has raised you out of darkness and I have bought your soul for God. That's what you don't see in the movie because Hollywood doesn't like to put that stuff up there. You see, what the bishop did is much what, like what Jesus Christ did for us. We were released from the power of the law because of his grace. And he's the one who took the sacrifice so much more than just a sock in the face and losing some silver. And the rest of the story plays out that Jean Valjean does become an honest man because of this act of grace that was shown to him. His life is transformed and he's no longer a violent man. He's no longer a taker. He's now somebody who's a giver. He becomes the mayor of a town and... Um, it's just a, it's a great, great story. Um, it's really worth seeing if you have never seen it, but Les Miserables, great story. He adopts this young girl named Cosette uh, from a woman who's uh, a woman with a bad reputation. She dies and he basically has to be the father for her. Great picture of redemption. Great picture of what it is to be released from the law. But you see, the bishop had a choice. He could either side on the side of law and prosecute this guy or have grace. And it's like what Jesus tells us. You know, he says that we're supposed to go the second mile when someone forces you to go with them for a mile, you go with them too. And when somebody strikes you on the cheek, you turn the other cheek. You see, this is the law of grace. This isn't the law. You know, if somebody strikes you, I'm gonna sue you, I'm gonna make a million dollars. That's pretty much the mentality of the world. But for a Christian, it's if you strike me, then, you know, if, if you strike me in the other cheek, maybe you'll have an opportunity to listen and I'll get to speak grace to you and tell you about Jesus Christ. Or if somebody wants to sue me for my tunic, he says, give me your coat as well. Jesus is talking about not having that sort of natural rebellion and this insistence to be under the law. Because if you're under the law, the law will fall on you because you're a sinner, just like me. Amen? Yeah. All right. Being free comes with an implicit honor of living it. Just like Jean Valjean, he had the opportunity to become the person that he then became 
because of the grace that was shown to him. And we have been shown so much greater grace because of what Jesus has done for us. So we don't live by the letter, we live by grace. Verse seven, so what shall we say then, Paul says, is the law sin? If, if all I need is a sign that says don't touch the paint, I, and suddenly I have to touch the paint, it must be we have too many laws. You know, if we didn't have any laws, if we didn't have any police, if we didn't have anybody that could stop anybody from doing whatever anybody wanted to do, everything would be fine because people are good. World full of Charles Manson, sure. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is it because we produce laws that produces sin? It says certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. By the way, that's the toughest one of the 10. You know, you shall not have any other gods before me, not make an idol and bow down and worship it. Uh, you shall honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery. You, you, know, you know the commandments. The 10th one cuts right under your skin and it says, you shall not covet. For those of you who don't, not familiar with this word, it means to have a strong desire. Don't have a strong desire for anything that belongs to anyone else or anything sitting on the showroom floor or anything that Amazon tells you is new. <laughs> Don't covet anything you see on TV, not your neighbor's wife. You see, it's not about adultery, it's about wanting. And so when you read that law, you go, what? Well, listen, you know, the others, I could, you know, I could kind of fudge and look pretty good, but that one, don't have a strong desire for anything that belongs to anybody else. Some of you came in here and somebody was sitting in your seat. You broke that one. <laughs> you went in the kitchen and said, do not touch, and you saw it moved. I wish I knew who did that, it, you know. I took the water, I confess. <laughs> we all knew that. <laughs> For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So the law is useful because it shows us where the boundaries are and that we're boundary breakers. But sin, which by the way is inside of every person, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I mean, if somebody said, don't touch that, I don't really have a problem now, but there was a problem where I'd touch it just to make trouble. What do you mean? Like this? Or you mean I can't kick it like this? <laughs> or I can't break it like this? I mean, that's how rebellious I was. God help me. Thank God I'm not a slave to that anymore. But apart from the law, sin is dead. If you don't have a law, then you don't have a sin. If God didn't say don't do it, then it's not wrong. But as soon as somebody says don't do it, suddenly you want to do it. The, the, you know, hey, where do you want to go for dinner? Ah, I want to go to this place over here. Well, they say you need reservations. Oh, well, I want to go even more because it's probably <laughs> packed. That's the sinful nature. That's what's going on inside of us. The thing you can't have is the thing that you want. And the thing that you have is the thing you don't appreciate. That's the sinful nature. So, you know, the law is a mirror. Now, most people look in the mirror and they tend to see what they want to see. You know, the one eyebrow that has, an, you know, has a hair that goes way up here, you'll miss it. I've missed it. Many times my wife tells me about it. Or the little tuft of hair that grows on the top of my ear. Or, you know, if you're looking in the mirror, you're looking for something specific, you'll miss it. But see, if you're going to look in the Bible and you're just going to pull verses out and look for what you want, you'll find whatever it is you want and you'll walk away and you won't understand the rest of it. So we have to be very, very careful that we don't see the things we want to see and we're blind to the things we don't want to see. It's like hearing. You know what selective hearing is? That's when my wife says, I told you that yesterday and I go, no, you didn't. You're a liar. <laughs> and then I have to give her all kinds of laws. If I'm watching TV, 
don't talk to me. I don't hear you. If I'm having a conversation with someone else, I did not hear what you said. And we have all these laws now that, that she understands. I am a singularly focused person. She, don't even try to make contact with me like this because I, I won't see you. We tend to see the things we want in the mirror. Like when I look in the mirror, I, f I see an 18-year-old. And when I wake up in the morning, I can tell you I don't feel like an 18-year-old. <laughs> but you have to be careful because the scripture is a mirror. It helps us to see how badly we need a savior and how much we need to lean on him every hour because without him, we can do nothing that is good. So we look in the mirror and sometimes <laughs> think there's something there that's not really there. You know, you think, we used to have a mirror in Keyport, which was awesome, on the back of the bathroom door. Karen Foley likes that mirror. Uh, did you ever get that mirror? <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> but you, I, I'm telling you, it was like being in a fun house. You look at this mirror and you're like, I don't look too bad in that mirror. And I can tell you that's, that's why most people don't want to look in the scriptures because when you look in the scriptures, you see how you truly are. When you hear that there's sin inside your heart and all you need is one law to trigger it and suddenly you've got desire, the 10th commandment being broken, that's, that's rising up and you suddenly want to do the thing that you can't have. That's the sinful nature. The only way out of that is death, by the way. But I can tell you that it doesn't need to reign in your life Amen. because Jesus is here. <laughs> Many people will look in the mirror and blame the mirror for what they say. It's like looking in the scriptures and being angry at God because of a truth or somebody being angry with you. Listen, I voted for this guy. <laughs> but I will not take hair tips from him. So just because somebody comes up and tells you the truth, don't be mad at them because they did so. And we're not a slave to one another's opinions, but we should love one another and understand that God speaks through people as well as uh, the book. And so we're open to that because we know we're not perfect. Verse 9, Paul is speaking in the, in, the, in the past tense. He's saying, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. You know, God's word is supposed to be a path for us and a mirror for us. It's not supposed to be death, but what ends up happening is because I have a sinful nature, God tells me all these things I shouldn't be doing, suddenly I'm doing them. Why is that? Because there's sin inside of me. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, it rules you. So he says, I was alive once without the law. Now, this is Paul who grew up in a, in a, a good family. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. What's he talking about? He's not talking about a certain point in time. He's talking about everyone's experience. There was a point at which I was free. There was no law that said, ladies' breakfast do not touch. There was no law, and I was cool. Everything was fine until they put that sign up. And then all kinds of things came up in me, and guess what? I'm found to be a sinner. I'm guilty. I find out that I have a sinful heart, and I have rebellion in my heart against God and a resentment towards people sometimes and I died. It's the same thing as though I took the fruit all over again and bit into it. The law reveals that my heart is not right. And you can share this with unbelievers. You know, they say, well, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. Oh, really? Well, what do you do with all your imperfection? What do you do with the desires that you have in your heart for yourself that you don't even reach? How do you handle failure? How do you, hand, how do you handle an addiction that you have? How do you handle your life being all out of priority? How do you reconcile that to being right with God? You can't, not without Jesus Christ. 
So it's the wet cement thing. I see the sign, I keep walking, I figure, ah, it must be old, and so I keep walking. There's traffic, everybody's all lined up in traffic, and there's cones, and you go, there's a whole lane open. Why doesn't anyone see that this entire lane is wide open? So I'm going to pull off the road because I don't believe these signs and it's wet cement. <laughs> That's why they put those things there. I don't know if you've ever been tempted to not obey a sign or not look out for cones or think, oh, well, this was done days ago. This is the weekend. There's nobody around. It's there for a reason. And you see, then you wake up and you go, uh-oh, I'm a bonehead. And everybody driving by knows it. <laughs> we waited in line and you didn't. <laughs> or you see signs that talk about a low bridge. And that's a problem. You know, if you have a 12-foot truck and it says 10 feet on a bridge, don't try it. But you see, that's what the law is. And so when you say the word law or this level of perfection or what should be, it always leaves us wanting. And it shows that we're not all good people. Not all of us are good people. Not any of us are good people. There's not one. We all need a savior. We all need a new heart and a new mind. We need to be put on track with the Lord because it brings death. And guess what? Now you're dead. <laughs> you are guilty you are, you are found to be in sin and there's only one punishment for it and that's to follow the devil and all of his angels to a place called hell. That is a literal place that God did not create for human beings. He created for the devil and his angels. But you then fall company with them because all of us are sinners. And the soul that sins must die. And the only way to pay the payment is with an eternity separated from God or accepting the free gift of life that came through Jesus Christ by believing in his birth, his life, his sacrificial death, his burial, and his resurrection. Amen. And through simple faith, God comes in and makes a change in your life so you're a new person. So, I'm no longer under the law, but I will observe it because I realize the purpose in it. Verse 11, for sin inside of us, taking occasion by the commandment, which is the law, deceived me and by it killed me. I got busted trying to steal cookies off the <laughs> kitchen counter. <laughs> we have a house with two dogs and those two dogs will eat anything. Food, non-food, they'll eat anything. They eat Legos, they eat any sort of rubbery uh, action figure, We've seen some of them come out, yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. You have to pick up after these dogs. It's like a treasure, tr uh, you know, it's... Anyway. But you see, the dog is going to do that which by nature the dog is going to do. Uh, the dogs are always hungry, even though they're fed very well. They're always wanting to eat something else. That's just the way it is. That's what it is to be sold to sin. That's what it is to be a slave to sin. I have to have something to fill me up. If I don't have something else to fill me up, I will walk around empty and I can't handle it. I need something. I need someone. I need an experience. If you're an adrenaline junkie, you need to jump off of something or you need to go extremely fast or you need to get on a roller coaster or, you, or the next vacation or I need, a, I need a raise or I need a better job or I need to move to a nicer neighborhood. Or It's always trying to fill up the flesh and the flesh is never satisfied. Contentment is the opposite of that. And with Christ, we can be content. Amen. It's enough. If I have food and clothing with that, I will be thankful and I will be grateful. And we have so much more than that. You know, and sometimes we work together with other people <laughs> to get what we want. <laughs> and we can step on them and work together with them to get the things that we want. And we can kind of manipulate people to get what we want because we have this strong desire. And the law says... You shall not covet anything that's your neighbor's. That's why we need a savior. And it doesn't happen just to dogs. It happens with kids. You tell them not to do something, and that's the only thing they want to do is the thing you told them not to do. There was a story of a man who, leaving the house, left his children in the care of a babysitter, and he told his kids, and he doesn't know why he did it, he told his kids, 
Listen, don't put beans up your nose. <laughs> and he says, I don't know why I said it, but that night we got a phone call and had to go to the emergency room because the youngest one had found the beans and put them up in her nose which she wouldn't have otherwise done had not been instructed that there was a law against it, <laughs> thus proving the issue. You tell a child something like that, and it's the only thing that they can think about. It's like, don't think about pink elephants. <laughs> There's residual in all of us, but it no longer controls us. And there are cameras everywhere, so eventually you will get caught being on camera it's funny, somebody's watching every keystroke of your computer and every button push on your phone. There's somebody watching and somebody making merchandise of you, just so that you know. Verse 12 and 13, therefore, the law is holy. There's nothing wrong with laws, they're important and they keep us all safe and aren't you glad we have them. It doesn't create sin, it reveals sin. And the commandment is holy and just and good. So everything that God says is right. If you disagree with the word, you know who's wrong. Has then what is good become death to me? Well, that would be good. Just take away all the laws and I'll be good. Certainly not. But sin that is inside of each one of us, that it might appear to be sin, was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. The whole point of the law is to reveal sin in each one of us. If, if you're turning the pages and you're not under any conviction whatsoever, I'm not talking about condemnation, but if, if, you're not, if you're not reading the scriptures and getting conviction about what you need to do about it, well, you're not reading it right. You know, we tend to, we tend to look at the scriptures uh, with a magnifying glass and study it and understand the original languages and all of that, and, and I think that's hugely important. But the problem is we don't necessarily look to ourselves to find out what kind of what kind of thing is in me, you know, see if there be a wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting is not the usual trek. What we do is we read it for everybody else. Oh, somebody, you know, I wish somebody else that I know was at this sermon today, Pastor. I really think that, you know, you would have done them a lot of good if they were here to hear this. You're, you're not listening. The scriptures are for us. They're for each one of us individually to, to eat and digest. And sometimes it's a little sour in the stomach. But that's what we do with the word. And so we get a magnifying glass out and we take a look at ourselves and we say, okay, Lord, what is it that I need to do for you? The scripture says, for the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword and it penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit. That's that which is of the earth and of me and that which is of God. And joints and marrow and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Did you know that your heart has thoughts? You know your heart has attitudes, but did you know that your heart has thoughts? We tend to use the word of God to look into everyone else's life and look afar and figure out how they need to get it right. What we could do, what we could do and what I think we need to do as a body is we need to check each other out and not only make sure that we're free of bugs, but make sure the rest of us are free of bugs. So we use the word of God firstly on ourselves, and then we can go picking through somebody else's hair, right? Come on, brave people. You got to tell me when that, that one hair has grown way off my eyebrow. I'm depending on you. The scripture tells us that the law no longer reigns in our life. It no longer tells us what to do because our relationship with the law, the law guides us because we have a relationship with God and we do that which naturally pleases him out of a new nature which he gives to us. It's nothing that we can boast of in and of ourselves. Galatians 3, 21 to 25 says, is the law then against the promises of God? Well, certainly not. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been from the law. You know, if the law would have saved us, it just given me 10 commandments would have taken care of it. Oh God, I didn't know you wanted these things. Now I do, I can do them, no problem. Eh, no way. If that's all it took, God would have done it and Jesus wouldn't have had to die. But the scriptures confirmed or confined all under sin. 
In other words, it shows us all guilty. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. You see, the law is to show us that we have a need so that we have a savior. And so we would accept Christ Jesus. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor or schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith, not by keeping the law. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. A lot of us want to do what's right so that we look right, so we feel better about ourselves. If that's the case, you missed it. You're already made right through Jesus Christ. You're under grace. You're adopted as his child, and he will never leave you or forsake you. Don't think that you need to do something for God to love you, ever. I know, because I'm a sinner, and God loves me, and he's gonna take me to heaven, not by anything that I deserve, but because Jesus Christ died for me. I just wish you guys would understand that the depths of your heart that you are received and accepted by the Lord Jesus Christ on the basis of his character alone because there's nothing good that we can contribute. And then what happens is I naturally do those things which please the Father. It's, I'm not forced to, I'm not handcuffed to it, I'm not, a, I'm not burdened by it, and I'm free. I'm free to serve God from a right relationship through Jesus Christ, amen? That's why it says grace on the outside of the building because that is it. Last slide. Your righteousness comes from a relationship, not religious ritual or rigorous law keeping. If you haven't realized, that's the same slide for every week because it's important that we understand that. We're gonna get into uh, the second half of chapter seven in two weeks. Next week, our brother is going to give a sermon, Mr. Brian Walter, and it will be his farewell sermon to us. So I trust that you guys will be here and be expected. Pray for him and his wife as they get ready for their new move. Uh, they're going to need it because this right here, this doesn't come around all the time. We'll pray for something better. Let's pray as the worship team comes up. Father, you know our hearts, and I thank you that you have freed us from the power of sin and death. That we're no longer held bondage to be good enough for anything. That because of your love, because of your son coming, you yourself in the person of your son dying on the cross for us, that we have new life in you. And that you've sent your Holy Spirit to live and abide in our hearts so that we would naturally do those things which please you. And yet, Lord, we still struggle with the flesh, with the old programming, even though we have a new hard drive. I pray, Lord, that you might help us to understand that we're free, that sin no longer controls us and doesn't rule in our mortal bodies, that we might live in a loving relationship with you and not in a rigorous law-keeping mentality. We thank you, Lord, that you came and died so that the power of the law is broken and it no longer stands against us as an accuser because you're our defense attorney. Thank you, Lord, for your love and for your grace. Help us to be filled with it today that we might show it to others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.